So um, our first speaker today is Vice President of Congress, Shundip Mongkol from Chi Chiang Mai University. Dr. Pongrook received his PhD in pharmacology and toxicology from Ohio State University. So after graduation, he returned to Thailand and taught instruct um, at Chiang Mai University in the forensic medicine department. And later in 1995, became the head of forensic medicine department. Since then, Dr. Pongrook has been reshaping higher education, taking on areas and leadership roles, serving as associate dean in several key areas, he has served as Associate Dean for Student Affairs and Education, Associate Dean for Planning and Personal Action, Associate Dean for Research, and Director for Medical Center Excellence at Faculty of Medicine. He is currently serving as Vice President for Chiang Mai University Strategy and Finance. Dr. Pongrick has been a key collaborating partner for Go High and has served as Honorary Co-Chair for the third ICOFI Congress, which is International Congress on Pathogen at the Human Animal Interface in Chiang Mai in 2015, and has continued to be a strong partnership for OSU Go High. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I will introduce our second speaker um, before his talk. So again, to all the attendees, welcome to this session. And if you have any um, question, please um, use the Q&A box. Um, we will have questions directly after um, Dr. Prongret's presentation. Again, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Prongret. The um, floor is yours. You're on mute, sir. Hello, good morning, Dr. Su. Okay, you hear me clearly? Yes, I should say good evening to you, but thank you. Yes, we, we can hear you clearly. Yeah, you, it's, it's now it's, uh, evening time in Thailand. Anyway, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to join this 10 years anniversary of the Global One Health Initiative of the Ohio State University. Let me introduce myself a little bit. I am Dr. Pong Rak from Chiang Mai University. I'm now Vice President of Chiang Mai University, responsible for corporate strategies and finance. I am so, I'm also a uh, Buckeye's alumni, you can see from my tie. And uh, I would like to congratulate Professor Wan Busen for his excellent initiative in the Global One Health Program of the Ohio State University, which I believe is the biggest interdisciplinary program at OSU. Can I share my slide? Oh, can, can I share the, uh, my slide? Yes, please. You should have okay. um, capability. Okay, let me share it, share content. Uh, the host have to let me in. Amy, can you assist please? <clears throat> No. Okay. Can I? Yes, I think you should have a. Okay. Now. Okay. Now yeah. I can do okay. it. Okay. Start broadly. One minute. Okay. Now you can see my slide. <clears throat> yes. Okay. <clears throat> So my talk today will cover three parts. It starts with an introduction to Thailand and Chiang Mai University, and then goes on to talk about the collaboration between CMU and the OSU Global One Health Initiative. Finally, it suggests further opportunities and future collaborations. Let me introduce the Thailand and Chiang Mai University. Thailand is a country in Southeast Asia, and we are south of China and north of Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, Thailand is about 7,800 miles away from Columbus, Ohio. Almost a full day's travel by plane. On the clock, we are separately by 11 hours. So definitely right, right now is uh, your morning, but it's our evening. It is almost uh, eight o'clock in the evening uh, in Thailand. 
Bangkok is the capital of Thailand and is, is located in the central part of the country. Our university is in the city of Chiang Mai, which is about six, 360 miles north of Bangkok. The city of Chiang Mai is more than 700 years old. It was formerly the capital city of Lanna Kingdom, which, is, which has its own history. Chiang Mai became part of Siam, a previous name of Thailand, about 200 years ago. And many aspects of Lanna culture, especially in terms of languages, food, and dress, persist in Chiang Mai to this day. Chiang Mai city is a valley surrounded by mountains. It is the largest urban place in the north of Thailand with a population of almost 200,000. These pictures shows a panoramic view of Chiang Mai city with the Ping River in the foreground. And you can see that it looks like the Olentangy River of Columbus. Chiang Mai is a tourist attractive city and tourism is a major source of uh, income. Before COVID-19, we host more than 10 million visitors a year, 30% were foreigners. So if you are looking for an interesting and beautiful place for your next vacation after COVID ends, please consider coming to Chiang Mai. We are very welcome. Let me introduce Chiang Mai University. Chiang Mai University was established in 1964 as the first institution of higher learning outside the capital city of Bangkok. We are a comprehensive university like Ohio State University. Our vision is to be a leading university committed to social responsibility and sustainable development. We have 27 schools of all faculties covering the areas of health science, science technology, social science and humanities. We have one graduate school for the health science. We have faculties of associated medical science, dentistry, medicine, nursing, pharmacy, public health and veterinary medicine. Chiang Mai University also has three research institutes, namely for health science, for science and technology, and for social science. Chiang Mai University has 88 bachelor degree programs, 138 master's degree programs, and 71 doctoral degree programs. We enroll more than three. Uh, 35,000 students each year, more than 82% are undergraduates. About 80% of our students come from the northern regions of Thailand. These slides show you some on-campus facilities. We have many outdoor spaces for lectures and recreation. We use electrical shuttles for campus transportation to reduce carbon emissions. We convert waste into biogas. And last year, we reduced around 22,000 tons of carbon dioxide. Each year, we welcome many foreign students. Our international offering include 11, bachelor's degree, 24 master's degree, and 35 doctoral degree programs. These are international programs. <clears throat> we manage a large and active students mobility program that annually hosts more than 1,000 foreign students from many different countries. You can see from these pictures, and the, our outbound program, about 500 CMU students go abroad each, each year to expand their ex educational horizons 
at the leading uni international universities. Let me tell you about our collaboration with the Ohio State University Global One Health Initiative. One World collaboration between our universities formally began in 2015 when Professor William I. Blustein, OSU Vice Provost for Global Strategies, and Professor Wan Wilson Krebis, Co-High's Executive Director, led a team to CMU to co-sponsor the third International Congress of Pathogens at the Human Animal Interface, or ICOPI. This photo was taken at the welcome party, and you can see our Lana traditional dress. Professor Wan Wilson is on my left, and CMU Dean of Veterinary Medicine, Dr. Quan Chai, is on my right. ICOPI is held every two years in this third ICOPI conference. There, are, there were 182 participants from 38 countries, 107 participants from abroad, and 75 from Thailand. An important collaboration between CMU and OSU is students' mobility, highlighted by our jointly administered veterinary field experiences in Thailand. This project was organized more than 10 years ago by Professor Nongnut in Panbut from the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine and by staff from the CMU Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Nongnut and Dr. Quan Chai, Dean of CMU Veterinary Medicine for their excellent collaboration. Usually 15 to 20 OSU students participate in this program, but like many other things, the COVID pandemic has temporarily put it only whole. My discussion therefore dates back to 2019, the last year of its operation. Before coming to Thailand and Chiang Mai, students completed coursework at OSU to learn about Thai veterinary practice, culture, religions, and society. The second part of a two-week trip to Thailand at the end of semester, during these few experiences, students learned to handle, diagnose, and treat various animals that would be not ordinarily find in Ohio. In 2019, the program started in Bangkok with a visit to the Snakes Hospital and the Thai Red Cross to learn about venomous snakes, venom collection, and anti-venom production. The program then continued in Chiang Mai and include visited to Chiang Mai Zoo for captive specific care to the Thai National Elephant Conservation Center for elephant diagnostic, various wildlife sanctuaries for exotic species treatment, and CMU laboratories for animal acupuncture and aquatic species medicine. <clears throat> Some spillover effect from the collaboration between CMU and OSU Kohai. After the third ICOPI conference with OSU Kohai in 2015, Chiang Mai University built on his experience to co-sponsor with the University of Minnesota, the fourth international conferences on one medicine, one science held in Chiang Mai in 2019. There were 373 participants from 24 countries, including 120 participants from abroad. 
one world go high related topics include infectious diseases, world without borders, contribution to building sustainable surveillance system, the public health impact of antimicrobial resistance and food safety, environment and climate changes, global one health initiative, and infectious and communicable diseases following natural disaster. Uh, another project that I would like to tell you is about uh, PODD, Participatory One Health Digital Diseases Detection. One of the more, most successful One World, One Health programs developed by Chiang Mai University began with financial support from the Skoll Global Trade Fund, now known as the Endemic Pandemic Foundation USA. In 2014, Chiang Mai University researchers received a grant to develop a mobile phone application to empower local citizens, especially in rural areas, to report immediately animal and human diseases occurrence. Within the first 34 months of its launch, PODD successfully stopped the 75 infectious outbreaks from spreading. This phone application is now used throughout Thailand and has been adopted by other countries. I'm proud to tell you that this year, PODD was named the grand prize winner by the Trinity Challenges and international coalition, including Google, Facebook, and Tencent, that encourages the innovative application of data analytics to help emergencies. Opportunity for further futures. The COVID-19 pandemic is a powerful example of a global health issues that has no boundary between nations. To combat a challenge like this, we need strong collaboration between countries and among healthcare professionals. We need national and international health monitoring and reporting. We need to share knowledge about drug resistance and disease prevention. We may need to conduct multinational vaccine trials and explore various types of medication. But strong partnerships do not occur overnight. They come from building relationships continuously over time so that knowledge, skill, trust, and good will all work together. I think the Ohio State University Global One Health Initiative is a good example of an excellent platform to build partnership between nations. Ladies and gentlemen, to strengthen this partnerships platform, especially with Chiang Mai University, further collaborations are possible. First, we can expand students' mobility programs to enrich students' experiences. In the post-COVID world, there will be undoubtedly be new issues concerning visa applications, health precautions, and the roles of distance learning. But these challenges can and will be met. Southeast Asia, Thailand and Chiang Mai University have much to offer Ohio State University students who wish to widen their perspective, broaden their knowledge, and deepen their cultural awareness, not just about health issue and ecotourism, but about many other one world matters of international concern. 
Second, we can conduct research on chair and common interests, perhaps focusing on the epidemiology of COVID-19 and other emerging, emerging infectious diseases in special or vulnerable population. Third, we can develop research proposal together and submit them to funding agencies. By diligently working together, we can encourage more staff exchanges and occupational placement for mutual benefits. Under Ohio State University go high strong partnerships. We may succeed in achieving the international multidisciplinary research that is necessary to confront one world health problem. Before I end my talk, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to congratulate OSU Go High. It's 10 years anniversary. I also would like to extend my heartfelt appreciation to Professor Wan Wusun and all the members of OSU Go High for their tireless and excellent work of the betterment of the world's people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Prangert, for that wonderful overview and um, wonderful innovation in technology and other platform education that Chiang Mai University has been successful in showing. I would um, like to, again, um, remind the audience, please um, put your any Q&A questions into um, the box. Um, Dr. Pongard, if you could unshare your screen. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much. So again, yep. I would like to um, have the session for um, Q&A um, for Dr. Pongrit. So um, I would like to start us um, by kicking off the session again. Um, I have been to Chiang Mai. I volunteer for um, six weeks outside of the Chiang Mai area. It is beautiful. And I extend mm -hmm. Dr. Pongrit's invitation for everyone to visit after. Very really um, welcome, very really welcome, <laughs> Dr. Su. When, when was your last visit here? Oh, and it was 1999, but um, I was not able to go to the yeah. But, um, but oh. my husband did, um, he was in Chiang Mai for one year as an exchange student. So again, we oh. love um, the area. So, okay, um, please welcome again. <laughs> thank you. Um, and Dr. Paul, again, if you could unshare your screen and then we'll just have you on as a panelist in the photo. Okay. So um, Dr. Pongert, as you had um, commented in terms of the pandemic and the yeah. um, and how it has affected the world, in terms of for Asia and worldwide, how do you feel the pandemic has unveiled potential challenges and opportunities that are needed to improve global One Health? Um, if you may be able to comment on that. Uh, I think, uh, after we, if we look at this pandemic, and I think it's very, very uh, challenging uh, and, and very, uh, I mean, very important, very imp uh, high impact on the, the health problem. Uh, in only in Thailand, we, what we learn is we cannot stand alone by one university or one institute. What we have done now, we, uh, try to work together as a one one hell, and I believe that uh, we have to work with other countries to share the knowledge. Because if we if uh, uh, individual countries, individual nations, individual university try to work on themselves, the speed will be very slow. But at this time, uh, this pandemic, especially COVID nineteen. It changed very fast, so we need the knowledge of uh, uh, many institutes to work together. So I think the, the concept of one world is very, very necessary, very important. And uh, I, 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 I don't know, in, 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 in my, my uh, workplace, we get, get, gather together uh, 
uh, either medicine, nursing, pharmacy, everything, immunology, whatever. So I think we, we need to uh, uh, work more, uh, work together uh, to, to improve the, the situation of uh, health issue in regions. Thank, thank you. Um, as I wait for um, any uh, Q and A's, and Amy, if you could help me monitor the box as well. So um, I think, oh, yes, yeah. If you could share your um, yeah. Um, so I think um, you have demonstrated how artificial intelligence um, and also. Um, applications using the phone with your yeah. EODD program has really yeah. changed um, our current advances. I'm wondering for our audience who are on, where they're representing many diverse um, areas and different regions, um, how do you foresee um, the, the integration of um, artificial intelligence and um, mobile applications and how, um, do you foresee this in terms of um, changing the dynamics and how can someone um, be more involved in this type of entity? Uh, very good questions. Uh, I am not sure that I can answer the, your, the, your, your question or not, but uh, I think uh, when we we may not use this as a, the uh, artificial intelligence uh, as as a as a computer uh, people they, they 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 understand but i think we we at least we can uh, have a early detection from the the uh, rural area or from the the uh, front front the the the, the area because uh, if we can uh, plug in or set up some uh, reporting system that uh, people in the villages or in the rural area or in the, the urban area they can they can uh, notify to the the uh, the central data and then we can uh, do something that to to combat that uh, uh, situation that that diseases so. Uh, I think this this uh, kind of uh, uh, reporting system by application is uh, quite necessary. Uh, fortunately, the, in Thailand, we can use the mobile phone cover almost uh, every area. So uh, even though the, the situation occur in some uh, rural area, they still can use this uh, uh, mobile phone application to report, uh, but we, I'm not sure that we can, we will go up to the artificial uh, intelligence uh, at this time, but I, I'm in the, in the future, maybe, yeah. I not, I'm not sure I can uh, answer your, the, your question or not. Great, yeah, so. thank you. No, thank you so much. And our um, second speaker will also be able to add some to the um, machine learning as well as artificial yeah. intelligence. So we could clearly yeah. see that this is a path forward. Um, so I wanted to um, ask another question as we wait for additional. So we could clearly see that you have made great advances in um, education in your various leadership responsibilities, and also in the connection between Ohio State University and Chiang Mai University in these yeah. um, veterinary programs. Um, can you help us um, with our other audience who may be from other areas? How does um, one, um, increase this type of collaboration for them if they want to establish something um, like this? Mm. Uh, actually, very important question about how to, if, if we want, would like to establish more collaboration, especially education or student uh, mobility. Uh, I think the, the one that I told you uh, before, I think because I think the 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 key is, is professor from both sides 
know each other and try to work out on each other. So Professor Nongnut, she 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 would like to to uh, explore the to 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 give opportunity for for uh, OSU student to learn about other, another world. So she tried to work on the the uh, uh, school of medicine, veterinary medicine here in Thailand, and and I think this is the the core or the main of uh, success. So if we need to uh, uh, intro to introduce the next uh, another uh, collaboration, I think uh, we may need to find out the right person to work together. But anyhow, anyhow uh, since I'm also uh, OSU alumni and also the uh, work as a CMU, uh, personally, at, uh, if any uh, discipline, any faculty would like to connect or would like to extend something, some project like this, uh, please feel free to contact me by email. I think we, I give my email in, in, in my bio already. Uh, so but, but I'm, I'm, by, by myself, I'm very happy to, to link between uh, uh, both universities soon. Thank you. And we will um, share um, um, the contact information for um, Dr. Pongrek. This um, session will be recorded. So for colleagues who um, did not have the opportunity to join, certainly um, this invitation, as you have heard, uh, is open um, to all. Um, yeah, Mr. please. Um, Ponger, we really mm -hmm. would like to um, thank you for um, your continued dedication to higher education learning and your extensive collaboration with Ohio State University. Um, my pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay, um, okay. So, thank you, Sue, and thank you, everyone. Okay, I don't see any okay. other um, questions or anything. Amy, do you see? Great. I don't see any additional questions at this time. Okay. So I would like to um, take this opportunity to transition to our second speaker. Um, again, another OSU Buckeye alum. So very proud of all the connections. So um, our second um, speaker today is Dr. Shindahar Naranyanan. So Dr. Shindahar received his BS in pharmaceutical sciences from University of Mumbai, a PhD in pharmacology from Ohio State University and a postdoctorate in neuropharmacology from the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Shindhar has more than 20 years of drug discovery and development experience in India. He was vice president and head of innovation sciences for the In Infection Innovation Medicine Group in AstraZeneca, India. There, he was responsible for discovery and the development of potential clinical candidates for tuberculosis, an area true and dear to my heart, as well as malaria. As a serial um, entrepreneur, Dr. Shindahar is currently the founding director and chief executive officer of Foundation for Neglected Disease Research, FNDR. This is a nonprofit company with a mission to discover and develop drugs for disease of the developing world. As part of FNDR, Dr. Shindahar has been able to raise more than $5 million um, toward the development and the investigation of pre-clinical um, and clinical um, asset development. In keeping up with innovation in the exciting area of artificial intelligence and machine learning, Dr. Shindahar is also the co-founder of Peptris Technology, working in the discovery and development of new drugs. In terms of academia, Dr. Shindar has served as advisor for PhD candidates and continued to be a prolific um, publisher in drug development and discovery. As I stated, he has developed one drug as well as 18 clinical candidates in the areas of infection, oncology, diabetes, inflammation, and respiratory diseases. In industry, he has continued to innovate and hold uh, more than 15 patents. Dr. Shindahar is truly a, a vision of candidate between the academia, industry, as well as non-governmental agencies. And it's these type of collaboration um, that will help move us towards the new um, century. And without further ado, um, Dr. Shinhart, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Shuvan, uh, for the kind introduction and also for the invitation to be part of this 10th anniversary celebrations of uh, GOHI. It's a privilege and an honor to come back and speak to uh, 
students, faculty, and members of Ohio State University. Um, as Dr. Shu said, I am a Buckeye, and uh, the uh, fondness of coming back to Ohio State always remains. Um, so I want to, you know, uh, Dr. Pongro gave a very beautiful talk about uh, his university and the facilities available at Chiang Mai. Uh, my talk is going to be a lot more of science driven. Uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, the different ways in which my organization uh, brings one health together and the kind of work that we're doing within the organization. Uh, if I can share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir, we can see the screen, thank you. Wonderful. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about AMR and One Health uh, and the various aspects with which we're dealing with that. Um, as uh, Dr. Shu introduced, uh, my organization called the Foundation for Neglected Disease Research is a unique not for profit uh, one of its kind organization in India. Um, our main diseases areas of interest include tuberculosis, malaria, dengue, leash mania, rabies, and we work with uh, the SARS-CoV-2 strain as well. We are one of the few facilities in India, uh, especially in a non-governmental uh, setup, which has access to biosafety level three laboratories, which allows us to work on uh, some of these highly infective organisms um, like tuberculosis and now SARS-CoV-2 as well. We've contributed to one clinical candidate uh, for tuberculosis, which is currently in phase two clinical trials uh, and is fully funded by the Gates Medical Research Institute. These trials are currently underway in um, South Africa. This is the R&D facility. It's a standalone building of about 10,000 square feet with capabilities of doing uh, all kinds of biology, biochemistry, microbiology, cell culture. Uh, biosafety level two and biosafety three, uh, level three labs for the in vitro work and also uh, for the animal experimentation. We also do our own drug metabolism and fungokinetic studies, including the bioanalytical part uh, where we have uh, you know HVLCs and LCMS. Uh, we also have a small medicinal chemistry group which works on the synthesis of uh, various um, chemical molecules, which I'll show you. This is a portfolio of products that we have under development. Like I said, our lead candidate for the bread and butter is all in tuberculosis, where we have TBA7371, which is in phase two. We have a repurposing effort on chloroquine, which is currently ongoing. We hope to have this in clinical development uh, as a post-directed therapy for tuberculosis within the next 12 months. Plus, we have a pipeline of our own um, agents can get the point here okay. uh, of our own uh, agents, which are in different stages of development for tuberculosis. In addition, we work on malaria, dengue, leash mania, and we have some compounds which are now being tested for uh, their activity on SARS-CoV-2 and several other viruses. In terms of uh, the products which we have for development in uh, under the diagnostics and the devices, we work on diagnostics for tuberculosis. This is a clinical trial of about uh, 300 patients, which we have done to develop a blood-based diagnostic for uh, tuberculosis, where we could detect, uh, not only identify or diagnose tuberculosis, but also look at treatment progression and whether we could diagnose a case which is non-responsive to treatment and then change the therapy um, for tuberculosis, especially the drug-resistant cases. We also have a diagnostic which we are working on, bacterial versus viral. I'll try talk a little bit about this. And we also have a, a agent which works on depleting antibiotics from industrial and other waste material, uh, waste waters talk a little bit about that one as well. So in terms of the One Health concept, we work on uh, the environment, we work on uh, a variety of uh, or 
organisms which are you know of animal origin and we also look at treatment of several patients who are uh, infected with different bacteria or parasites or even viruses so the first part of my talk is going to be on using waste materials to deplete antibiotics from hospital effluents uh, as you know uh, the high antibiotic load in effluent water leads to a lot of antimicrobial resistance and there is no active mechanism which is focused on decreasing such an antibiotic load in waste water so keeping this problem in mind we went into uh, designing a device which would remove antibiotics from uh, the hospital effluents and we wanted to cover a wide range of antibiotics uh, of different classes which could be uh, adsorbed onto the waste material so uh, the current adsorption capacity that we have is about 125 to 250 mg of antibiotic per gram of adsorbent so you can imagine the kind of um, adsorption capacity that is there and if you have loads of antibiotic which are normally seen in the water which are in the microgram range we would be able to completely eliminate the entire antibiotics from the waste water we already have a lab scape prototype and we are now deploying this in the hospital setting uh, in different hospitals in bangalore india so this is just some data from a range of antibiotics that we started with since we worked exclusive uh, uh, significantly with uh, tuberculosis our first effort was looking at removing any of the anti tubercular drugs from the water and some of the gram positive gram negative acting drugs from the waste water as well and you can see that uh, as we went uh, from a 2 mg adsorbent to a 5 10 20 40 and 80 mg of adsorbent we could almost completely eliminate all of the antibiotics except for ethambutol from the waste water so we then took this as a base adsorbent and then built around this and we have a mix now which is being used which is called mix 3001 which is able to remove almost uh eight to 10 different classes of antibiotics from the waste water we have tried different cephalosporins we have tried beta lactams we have tried uh, you know mac uh, uh, macrocyclics we have tried you know penicillins so a variety of these can be removed from the waste water so what we want to do is contribute to the um, environment by removing these antibiotics from different water sources and allowing for a reduction in antimicrobial resistance as we go along not only do we do a uh, uh, elution of the antibiotic through the device once with this device we are able to almost have uh, 15 to 16 elution times uh, with the device and removal and successful removal of the complete uh, antibiotics so what this tells us is that if we deploy the device once in a hospital it could be used for a significant number of times before it has to be replaced so right now we are looking at a variety of uh, optimization trials with looking at ph looking at temperature looking at interaction times and then actually looking at how we would deploy this in a setting where this could be used not only in the hospitals but also in the community setting including residential areas so this was the first uh, aspect of my talk where we looked at an environmental impact of the work that we are doing now i want to move into more of the diagnostic part where we wanted to distinguish between the bacterial and viral infections to actually reduce the amount of uh, antibiotic prescriptions that are being given out and also in a country like india where you can get antibiotics even without a prescription in many areas how could you reduce the actual dispensing of those antibiotics to patients who don't need them especially those suffering from viral infections so with that in mind uh, we started looking at why we need these biomarkers for the guided treatment and based on a variety of um, um, aspects we decided that this was a good problem to go after and to have a high social impact with such a, a device so the first we did was to look at some ex vivo experimental models with gram positive and gram negative infections and looking at a biomarker called endogliptin uh, endoglin and um, this one 
actually goes up with response to the gram positive or the gram negative infection, as you can see. The second one we looked at was a mouse experiment where we infected the mice with gram positive and gram negative bacteria. And you can see that this biomarker in a non infected one is at very low level, but you can see almost a 30 to 40 fold increase with a gram negative or a gram positive infection. Now, this gave us a very good hint that in a bacterial infection in human beings, you could potentially use this as a biomarker if this translates in the clinical setting. Now, we also went into a hospital setting, and this is all you know, data crunched up from almost two years worth of work, where we are able to show that between a bacterial infection and a viral infection in a patient samples, you can see a significant difference between uh, the levels of this biomarker in the actual clinical setting. Now, all of this analysis was done using ELISA method, and we're trying to see if this can be converted into a diagnostic which can be used as a, a rapid diagnostic in pharmacies and in uh, uh, OPDs across uh, the country. The third aspect that I wanted to talk about is a bit of the COVID work that we're doing and the discovery of a small molecule antiviral agent for the treatment of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so the background is that since we had a lot of experience working in the biosafety level three, and also a team of trained biologists and animal model experts, we thought that this was a fantastic area for us to get into and actually make an impact on the community. So we got all the uh, strains of SARS-CoV-2, including the Wuhan uh, strain, uh, the Delta strain, Alpha, Beta, Kappa strain, and also all the cell lines that were required to actually do the work with the, uh, with the uh, SARS-CoV-2. We now have validated models for the in vitro and also the animal screening of various antiviral agents. I just show you some data. So this is graphs of the dose response curve with remdesivir, which is one of the antivirals that is being used uh, for the treatment of SARS-CoV-2. And you can see very nice dose dependent responses in a cell culture system of the action of remdesivir on uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We also tested other compounds like ivermectin and also favipiravir, both of which also showed activity in the in vitro system. We then went on to develop a, a hamster model, and this is the course of infection in the hamster. And this is similar to what we see in the human. You have a day one infection where you have a load of the plaque forming units in the lab. Day two, you see a significant increase. Day four, it's stable. And by day seven, almost all of the virus particles are out of the system and you cannot detect any platforming units in the lung. We then went on to test the remdesivir and favipiravir molecules in this model. And all of this data is from the day four uh, comparison. So you have the infection control, which shows you about eight logs uh, platforming units and a significant dose dependent response with remdesivir and also a significant response with favipiravir. This is just the histopathology of the lungs. And you can see a healthy lung here where you don't see any uh, inflammation or um, uh, edema. If you look at the infected control, you can see significant areas of edema and inflammation. And this is after treatment with remdesivir where you see that the viral particle uh, which caused the infection and the inflammation have been resolved. The same is seen also when you do the histopathology, and this is the normal lung. This is the lung which is infected. You can see a significant infiltration of uh, white blood cells and edematous uh, areas in the lung, and this is all resolved by treatment with remdesivir. Now we went and looked at combination of one of our compounds with remdesivir and looking at uh, how that would impact uh, the treatment in, these, in this animal model. So this is again the infection control and the treatment with remdesivir, you have a significant effect. Our compound alone didn't have a, a significant or a major impact as, as similar to remdesivir, but when we gave it in combination with remdesivir, you saw a significantly enhanced uh, response, uh, antiviral response 
in this model. We are now looking at how to progress this com combination into the clinical trials for treatment of SARS-CoV-2. Now, these are this compound A is actually a compound which is already being used for uh, another indication. So we believe that repurposing this for COVID will be significantly easy. And this is a compound which is also again a repurposed compound uh, which we have discovered and this is probably the first time that is being done across the globe. We want to move this as aspect into clinical trials. So you see the infection control, the remdesivir, and a nice dose-dependent decrease with our repurposed agent at 1, 3, and 10 milligrams per kilogram in this asset. We've also looked at another uh, small molecule, which is a proprietary molecule, a new one from FNDR. And this one, again, you can see that it's significantly reducing the viral loads in the lung as compared to uh, remdesivir. So with all of this, we now want to take this molecule into uh, development and see if we can get it into um, the clinic by the time the third wave, supposedly third wave, hits uh, countries in the, uh, in the world. So with that, I want to stop now and uh, you know, open to questions from you on any of these aspects. Thank you very much for your attention and also for the opportunity to present this work. Thank you, um, Dr. Shundra. What an impressive portfolio of drugs as well as diagnostics and even environmental absorbents and stuff. And again, I would like to um, ask the um, attendees, please, this is a great opportunity for you to um, type in your questions so that we can um, have um, this expert discussion. So let me um, kick off by stating in the area of drug discovery, um, as you were working for AstraZeneca company and now with your own um, foundation, um, what are the major challenges in getting a drug into the pipeline that you see and how do we um, improve and advance on that? So excellent question and a very difficult one, right? Uh, so I don't think there is one uh, easy metric which will allow us to take the molecule into development. I think it requires a series of uh, hurdles to be crossed before one can bring a drug into the pipeline, right? And probably as an organization which has limited access to uh, financial resources, it, it limits what we can bring in or who we can bring in as talent into the organization, right? And also uh, restrict the amount of money that we could put at risk uh, as we go along into development, right? And if you saw my last slide, it said fail fast and fail cheap, right? And that's what we try to do. We try to put in the most difficult hurdles up front and try to see if we can kill the molecule which has the least potential to make it as a drug for whatever be the reason, right? So we will do a number of um, uh, you know, organ related uh, studies early on in terms of cardiac toxicity or in terms of metabolic uh, um, uh, risk, which we would have with molecules. So we would put those up front and try to eliminate molecules before they, we spend a lot of time and effort into actually doing that work. Thank you. Yes. So certainly economics or economy plays a major part. And as we um, go transition to the area of diagnostics, so we're always looking for that rapid diagnostic test that's also low cost, low technical expertise. And as you have so mentioned, that could potentially go out to the front lines, right? In right. the pharmacies, dispensaries, and rural areas. So in your um, vision and your innovative thoughts, um, how do we advance this area as well for the global need? So that's, you know, that's probably the area where there is a highest impact right today. And uh, especially in the third world countries where access to antibiotics, uh, not only for treating humans, but for treating livestock or even the crops is uh, easily, easily accessible, right? And you really don't need uh, to, um, to have a prescription or you know, any kind of regulation governing uh, the use of these antibiotics, 
things are changing today. There are, there are regulations being brought in, but it's still, I think, too slow and too little, right? So when, especially when you have such scenarios, uh, diagnosing especially resistant bacteria is a key in treatment success and in actually saving lives, right? And we believe that that's an area where there's the highest impact is possible. And today, I don't think that we have any approved diagnostic which can distinguish between a bacterial and a viral infection, right? And so in countries where antibiotic prescription is rampant, doing a diagnostic or having a diagnostic which could quickly tell the doctor or the pharmacist who in many times is the dispensing or prescribing authority for um, antibiotics, it will be a great uh, um, contribution if we can do something like this. So that's an area that we would definitely like to focus on and to change the way the antibiotic prescription pattern happens. Thank you so much. And we have certainly seen with the COVID pandemic where we were seeing patients in the hospital, they were coming in acutely ill. And we were, you know, in the initial days, we did not have remdesivir or, you know, even the thoughts of steroid or, you know, like inter, you know, IL-6 inhibitors. So we were essentially piling on the antimicrobials, trying to find a diagnosis. And we clearly saw that there were patients who had co-infection, the majority, yeah. as you stated, were viral and that importance, you know, of being able to make a diagnosis to decrease um, the antimicrobial resistance. So I'm so appreciative of this panel of um, looking at the diagnostics. So in going in this route with antimicrobial resistance, so I'm shifting gears a little bit. So certainly the World Health Organization Center for Disease Control and Prevention has made this a frontline priority for the global health and efforts. And I'm so happy to see um, the diagnostic potential. So I'm again wondering, how do we open up this educational component? Like you work in academia, industry, NGO, how do we make the world know about AMR so that we can truly um, decrease this impact? So the, the only way is to go to the grassroots level, right? And to create the awareness. And uh, to that extent, my organization also works with school children, right? And we believe that school children in the age group or you know, who are in the fifth to 10th grade are probably the most, uh, 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 I would say, appropriate audience to start creating this awareness, right? And uh, that's the generation which uh, picks up these things really easily, uh, has access to internet and uh, you know, uh, different, uh, I would say, tools to actually learn about uh, AMR and also to spread the word, especially uh, since they are a target population who are being prescribed the antibiotics, right? So we have started a program where we are educating school children across uh, the state of Karnataka, which, which we are one uh, part of Bangalore is the capital of Karnataka, uh, which is one of the states of India and India has uh, 30 such states. So if, if you look at the reach that we have this year, we did about 2,500 school children. And uh, our intent is that the coming year, if COVID is not a roadblock, we would be able to reach about 25,000 school children across three different states in, in India. And that's something that we believe will create an impact. No, I, I um, really love the idea about reaching out to the school children. So certainly we are not yet aware of the impact that these children can make. And I know that globally, we have really reached out to this audience in terms of our environmental sustainability. So they have That's been right. educated on, you know, like what to use, what not to use. And they have come back to their homes and really demanded of their parents, this is what I have learned, this, you know, I know. So um, yes. so definitely an audience um, or of children, you know, that we can really utilize. And I love the innovative thinking um, from you. And I really want to encourage our attendees um, to also be, think outside of the box. So I, I do want to move into this, um, this children and this environmental area and, and all the impacts. So, so your um, assay with the absorbent in trying to decrease and ident or identify potential um, uh, um, 
re, like leftover from these antimicrobials um, that could potentially go into our water stores, into the environment. And we know that the impact is there. So again, how do we bring this beyond the children, beyond the to like make policy effort changes? What is the step there? So one, I think the only way you can bring about a policy change is to convince the policymakers that what you have is actually going to make an impact, right? And to that end, what we're doing now, so one of the advantages of this device is it's able to capture uh, bacteria, it's able to capture viruses also, right? So what we're trying to do now is to show that the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in the community water uh, is actually reduced by using a device like this, right? And uh, that in turn could potentially reduce the impact of COVID uh, in certain areas where this is deployed, right? So that's something that we're working with. We're working with a couple of different organizations to look at the prescription patterns of antiviral agents uh, like favipiravir, remdesivir, look at viral DNA in our RNA in the wastewater, and then correlate that to the incidence of COVID in those regions and try to see if we can make a correlation between uh, removing these from the wastewater and actual reduction in the incidence of COVID uh, and other transmittable diseases. No, I think that's wonderful. And I think the, um, the slide that you showed where you can actually remove um, you know, the or detect these other antimicrobials in the broader class and where, right. you know, we're using these antimicrobials, you know, globally and oftentimes in areas where you can simply go to the pharmacy chemistry and prescribe where other areas right. where there's more restriction. So in terms of that type of a global um, consciousness and sensing, how do we um, try to be able to um, have some type of not a control on antimicrobial prescriptions because we definitely want to be able to treat those that are needed, but also to be able to you know decrease antimicrobial resistance, decrease environmental harm. How do we put this together? Can you share your vision for us? So, so that that's where the One Health picture comes into, right? So, I think it's not a single piece of the puzzle. It's about bringing all these pieces together. And that's why the initiative that you guys are doing is really a fantastic initiative, right? And I think it's only by bringing all the pieces of these puzzles together that will actually solve the problem of EMI, right? Otherwise it's not gonna, if you leave out one piece of the puzzle, I think you're still gonna have the same problem uh, cropping up, maybe a little bit of a delay, but definitely the problem will still remain and crop up again. Right. So I think you need to put all these pieces of puzzle together and it has to be an effort starting from the grassroots level, uh, reaching to, uh, you know, the more advanced uh, prescription patterns. And this cannot be, and, you know, today the world is such a small place. It doesn't matter if you do something in India, you know, somebody sitting in US is going to be affected by it sooner rather than later. Right. And the same goes through for Africa or Southeast Asia or any other part of the world, right? So today it's not enough to just say that I'm gonna look at my house and my neighborhood and reduce this AMR. It's gonna require, really require a global One Health initiative. Thank you. And I really do believe that in this global One Health human animal environment, right? And just as you so eloquently stated, it's this collaboration, communication, knowledge sharing, you know, between the scientific leaders, but we also need to bring in other key stakeholders, right? You know, the yeah. policymakers, the NGOs, and also the community. So I really like your concept of really reaching out to the community. And then in order um, so that we're not siloed, we certainly seen with a pathogen can transverse the world, but these knowledge can also be shared rapidly. Absolutely. So, so in that sense, how do we promote this knowledge? Like you have so many different areas that you are, you know, in. How do we promote this for the mass to really bring about, you know, a global um, system? Right. So, you know, one of the things that we do as an organization is we encourage people from other parts of the state, the country, and also internationally to come and work with us. Right, to see what we're doing and to see if there is any which way we can help them 
with what we are doing, take it back to their own setting and implement it that way, right? Unfortunately, uh, since I've been a part of the uh, Global Health Initiative only for the last two years, uh, we actually tried to bring in people from uh, uh, Africa to come and train with us on a few things. Uh, so I had requests from people in Ethiopia, people in Nigeria, who wanted to come and work with my uh, laboratory group. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we've not been able to do that, but hopefully this situation resolves and we're able to open up our doors to people from the international community, students from the international community who want to come and learn about the different things that we're doing and also take back something to their own uh, countries. So I love this open invitation. So I want to extend it to all our um, attendees. Please Absolutely. take it back to your institutions, your organizations, and even myself, I will be calling soon. So I think Please. this is a great, great, wonderful opportunity. And as you have stated, certainly the COVID-19 um, pandemic has really you know, put a, um, a challenge for many of these, but it has also given us a lot of opportunities, you know, to advance yeah. science. And then I'm wondering if you might be able to share some of your thoughts on that and where it could be leading us. Absolutely. So, you know, uh, the work that we're doing within our laboratories, right? So there are, there are, I would say, uh, very few laboratories across the globe which have the capability to do the kind of work that we are doing within our labs. Right, uh, and which are openly accessible by people across the globe. Right, uh, so I'm not, you know, I've just skimmed the surface of the work that we're doing within the group. Right, so we work with uh, uh, COVID vaccines, we work with COVID diagnostics, we work with um, uh, devices which are uh, entrapping COVID or you know uh, destroying the virus particles. So. It's, it's a much broader panel of work that we're doing, and that is being done not only for companies and academic institutions within India, but also for companies and uh, um, institutions across the globe, right? So I work with companies in Korea, I work with companies in the US, I work with companies in Europe, and this is all done at a cost factor and a time factor, which is really reasonable and accessible. So it's truly accessible to people across the globe. Yes, um, thank you um, so much for that. And I think this um, time and this frame and how you're reaching out, you're not being siloed, we're sharing technology. So in your um, vision and looking forward, what do you feel like is a major global issue that, you know, that we should, um, you know, work towards launching, whether it's your company or the government, like what do you see in this um, calendar of ahead? A, a major global issue that we really need to get a hold of and stamp out. So one, one thing that I think COVID has taught us and me personally, uh, my learning is that uh, you cannot be prepared enough, right? And doesn't matter uh, whether it's, uh, you know, an antiviral agent that you need or an antibacterial agent or a next, you know, we don't know where the next pandemic is going to come from. And it is going to come. It's not that we are, we are going to run away from this, right? So uh, we had, uh, uh, I, I would say, much smaller scale events which happened in the early 2000s uh, with the MERS and, uh, you know, um, the H1N1 and the, all, all of those coming in. And this was a disaster that was waiting to happen, right, in, in many ways. And we were not prepared. I think when Ebola struck in Africa uh, and you had the first patients in the United States, there was a lot of effort that went into the Ebola research. But suddenly, uh, you know, the minute things quietened down a bit, the entire research stopped, right? And so I think the only which way uh, we can avoid such things is to have a global effort that's an ongoing effort to understand and be prepared for these pandemics, right? Uh, to develop more broad spectrum agents, to look at more hygienic procedures which are being implemented uh, on, on a wider scale, right? And uh, to bring, bring about these changes which are more permanent changes and not incidents we forget 
uh, really fast. Yes, and I, I certainly think all these mitigation efforts and preparation, I think the one sentence is that we cannot be prepared enough. I love this sentence from you because I think we have seen that. Yes, we have had you know the H1N1, the flu, and many of our institutions, including our own hospital, we had flu outbreak plan, right? We had, we prepare every yeah. year, but we could not have envisioned even this type of pandemic, we had the MERS and it was kind of isolated with some transmission. We had the initial SARS, you know, COVID one, and we had the, you know, from Hong Kong, then it went to, you know, Toronto, other areas, and we've seen this, but we could not have prepared ourselves enough for this. But um, it was good that, you know, we had these efforts. So in um, this type of preparation, as we um, close out the final hours, what is an innovative partnership that can make us go faster, further to achieve these One Health goals? So one, one of the major challenges, you know, uh, as an organization that we faced was access to some of these strains of viruses, right? Um, and being able to start work on them sooner rather than later, right? So, you know, uh, and this was a problem not only uh, in India, but even globally, right? So I think by the time the universities and the institutions in the US got access to the virus, it was a few months down the line. It was not immediate. So I think the one thing that would, that would change this is a partnership which allows for easy access to any of these viruses so that it could be a truly global effort to chase them out rather than you know make it into a siloed effort um, within regional and it you know this was china it could have been you know as easily it could have been india or any other country in the world and i think one needs to have and that's where uh, policy makers would come into you know uh, into the picture where easy access to this at a truly global level right with organizations like who uh, actually uh, spearheading such an effort, right, of global cooperation. Thank you. Thank you so much for those um, wonderful words. And we have certainly seen that it really does need to be more open and that with the global efforts working together toward one challenge, we can truly make a difference. We use the mRNA platform for other vaccine and rapidly you know, became the COVID. We use diagnostic medication that we have been using for other diseases and move them into this arena. And yeah. in while we're doing these things rapid, we have learned that we really do need also, you know, dedicated controlled trials because some of those initial you know antivirals they did not work but we need to feed the pipeline we need to have these organizations large ones to be dedicated to this global effort to really move things forward so i want to give you um, a chance for a last closing word before i close out the session i'm i'm, I'm just so proud to be part of to have been part of ohio state and to continue to be part of it right and i think it's universities like Ohio State, which have a global footprint, which are going to make the difference. And I really am so happy to be part of it. Thank you so thank much for that opportunity. Thank you, thank you so much. And again, I would like to thank both of our speakers, Dr. Panger from Chiang Mai University, as well as Dr. Shindahar, both OSU alumni Buckeyes, they make us proud. They're leaving the footprints globally, um, economic, you know, and of footprints. So today I want to um, take this opportunity again to thank everybody for your time. Your time is the truly a resource um, that we have. And so I hope that everyone will stay safe and healthy. We hope that together one day we can join face-to-face -face as we know that we are a resilient society and that we can truly work together to build a stronger, healthier, and more equitable global community. So um, as um, Global One Health and OSU, I want to thank um, everyone, the presenters, as well as um, your attendees for your time. And uh, we will, um, this re will be recorded, so we will have that available to you. We will have um, the contact information for anyone who wants to reach out. And we have, again, a series of other wonderful um, talks that are part of our Go High 10th anniversary celebration um, with it culminating um, in November. So please look for our calendars, look to our website, please reach out to us. We um, do wanna work together with everyone. Um, truly, we're one small world. Thank you again so much for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.